Why is the United States once again bombing Syria? It seems like it's one of their favorite pastimes, placing warships right on their doorstep in the Middle East. And is the United States actively trying to assassinate President of Syria Bashar al-Assad? It sure seems that way. Syrian journalist Kavork Almasian, who of course uh, covers the covers geopolitics and does an amazing job at Syriana Analysis. Kavork, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Clayton. It's a pleasure to be with you. So let's talk about the Assad piece in a second, the assassination plot against Assad. But first, the, obviously, over the past 24 hours, additional bombings we've seen on Syrian targets, uh, resistance fighters firing back against those those attacks against United States positions. What do we know about those latest attacks? First of all, we know the claim from the Pentagon that uh, F-15s and F-16s probably participated in bombing uh, what is called al Bukamal uh, border crossing. And al Bukamal border crossing is essential for Syria because the United States occupies what is called al Tanaf border crossing. The United States has forces on the borders between Jordan and Iraq. They're blocking Syria's trade routes between uh, these countries and also the connectivity between Tehran, Baghdad, and Damascus. Therefore, the Syrians, after liberating the deserts from ISIS uh, with the help of the Russians and the Iranians, they opened a new border crossing in Al Bukamal, and this Bukamal is the only route now that uh, uh, that Syria can do business with its neighboring countries, and uh, especially on the eastern side, and also having this Iranian leverage in the region. So the Americans want to hit this uh, border crossing in order to block any access of Iran to back this connectivity, as I mentioned, of this alliance between Baghdad, uh, Tehran, and uh, and Damascus, and also Beirut. This is essential uh, life-saving uh, route uh, for, the, for the Syrians, so they protect it. But the Pentagon says that they are bombing what is called Qod, Iranian-backed militias. Those are not Iranian militias. They, they are Syrians, and uh, they fight under the Syrian uh, army formations. Ah, and the Syrian but the New York Times yeah. today, Kavork, so then you're disagreeing with the front page of the New York Times today, which, as you know, is a bastion of journalism. And really, we hold it up as the greatest newspaper in the world. And of course, the New York Times today says that these are Iranian, literally in their headline, Iranian backed proxies. So these yeah. are all Iranian. They're clearly trying to tie this to Iran. So you disagree with the New York Times, Kavork. This is shocking news. I it's, it's like calling the, for example, the Israeli army a CIA-backed uh, militia or calling the Israeli army a Pentagon-backed army. It's the same. Uh, Syria is supported by Russia, is supported by Iran. Syria buys weapons from Iran and Russia, and it, it gets also support, political and military support from them. Uh, so the justification that those are Iranian-linked or Iranian-backed militias, first of all, under international law, it doesn't give any justification for the Americans to bomb. Uh, Syria to begin with. Secondly, these forces who were bombed are Syrian forces. And if you want to say they are backed by Iran, this is a political cover for bombing Syria. But uh, on, a, on, a legal, on a legal base, if you want to speak legally, Syria has invited Russian forces to come and also there is a strategic military alliance between Syria and Iran. So Iranians have advisors in Damascus, but they don't have combat forces in Syria. No, zero. Uh, the Iranians never sent fighting combat forces underground in Syria. They had their advisors and also military and intelligence support. All this bombing that happened there against Syrian forces and al Bukamal border crossing, as I mentioned, it's a message to Syria, to Iran, and to the regional countries that if this war expands, the Gaza war expands. And if Hezbollah intervenes in this conflict, which seems to be coming closer and closer as we speak, uh, be because of the carpet bombing of the Gaza Strip and the clear plan of ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians from the Gaza Strip to the Sinai, uh, it seems that Hezbollah will intervene uh, soon in this conflict. If that happens, the Israeli side it doesn't have the same combat readiness and experience as Hezbollah. Hezbollah has been fighting in Syria for 12 years, and they have sophisticated weaponry unlike Hamas. Therefore, Americans will also intervene if that happens. If Americans intervene, what they're going to do is, if you check the map, because they have a, a military site in a, a Tanaf border crossing, they will try to seal all the borders between Syria and Iraq so that there would be no access of Syria to Iraq and to Iran anymore. More. So this is the plan. But on the other side, the Syrian, the allies of Syria, they have sent a very clear message to the Americans 
by bombing the illegal occupation bases in, in Syria and in Iraq. Let's remember the Iraqi parliament voted and asked for the American forces to leave the country. And they said, no, right. <laughs> we're not in fact, the not only, not only <laughs> Not only no will we not leave, we're also going to build a second military base on oil fields. So we're not going to yes. leave, even though you want us out of your country, we're going to build a second yeah. base on your oil fields. Yeah. And in Syria, in Syria, the uh, presence of the uh, American forces uh, is illegal, again, under international law. They, they are there since 2017, 2018 to occupy the oil fields to uh, disallow the Syrian government of using the revenues of the oil to reconstruct the country. This is the main uh, purpose of the... So basically, the, the forces who are in Syria are, are acting as pirates uh, on, on Syrian territory. So any, any act of violence using force against... American forces uh, is uh, permissible under international law. I'm a Syrian and I want to, I, I don't any American to die uh, in the course of this conflict. I want all the Americans to be in, in the United States unharmed and untouched. But if you come to my house and you are stealing my water and my, my oil, and if I use violence against you to kick you out of my home, then you have to ask the first the question, why am I at the first place in your home? This is the question that nobody asks. Look, Fox News never mentioned it, CNN, MSNBC, no one mentioned the fact that those forces in Syria to begin with are illegal under, under international law. Therefore, the use of force against them is permissible, but they don't give you this context. Otherwise, the people will ask, start asking questions. Why are, what are we doing in Syria? Right, right. Members of Congress have started asking that question, uh, Matt Gates, among others. Why are we in Syria? And it's been voted down, so the United States will continue to occupy Syria. I do want to ask you before we talk about Assad, specifically about the Golan Heights. And of course, if Hezbollah intervenes in the north, what will Syria do with the Golan Heights? And of course, pushing out 2.3 million Palestinians into Egypt. As Scott Ritter just told us moments ago on the show, that would be a war crime, and Egypt will not tolerate that. And, or, and, and if Israel wants to get into a fight with Egypt, they will lose. So a lot of moving pieces right now. But take the Golan Heights piece. What does Syria do there? Actually, uh, there, there are sequences that we have to follow. Uh, if this conflict expands. The first thing we are going to see is uh, Hezbollah intervention in two ways. One, we will see uh, precision missiles fi being fired from the Hezbollah side against the settlements and against the military and uh, installations, intelligence in installations in, in, in Israel. The second thing, we will see ground incursion into the Israel. And uh, as Scott Ritter said multiple times, by the way, he, he said that if Hezbollah wages such a ground offensive against northern Israel, uh, if you compare it with Hamas, it will look like from a, a play, from a children playbook because Hezbollah is very disciplined and very competent force. People forget the fact that Hezbollah is not only a political party anymore. They have over hundred thousand soldiers. They are uh, they believe in a in in a doctrine in a in a religion, and they also uh, have a very long. Uh, combat experience, unlike the Israelis. Last time Israelis fought was in 2006. And at the same time, the uh, Hezbollah, they have air defense systems, they have anti-tank rockets, they have uh, precision missiles, and also Yachont uh, missiles. Yachont is the only Syria has the Yachont missiles in, in the region. Yachont are the anti-ship anti cruise missiles. Those are very serious weapons. Therefore, we see all these American special forces going to Israel and also from Germany. They are stationed in, in, in Cyprus. These are all indications that Israel cannot defend itself alone. They, Israel needs its allies if this war expands. Second, from the Syrian side, if the Hezbollah intervention happens, I believe that there will be rockets being fired also from, from, from the Syrian side, and then the Israelis will come and bomb Damascus. They will try, uh, they will try to uh, eliminate the strategic uh, power of, of Assad in, in Damascus, and they have told this to the French, uh, yeah, yeah, the have not uh, reported this that the French uh, delivered this message to Hezbollah that if you intervene in this conflict, Israelis will try will assassinate Assad. So we will see two. There are two units, combat units, ready uh, from the Syrian side. They have been getting prepared since 2018 uh, when Syria uh, liberated these uh, areas on the borders with Israel. Because remember, before 2018. For three to four years, the border between Israel and Syria was occupied by ISIS and by al-Nusra Front. Both are Al-Qaeda offshoots. And there was not a single bullet being fired from Al-Qaeda or ISIS against Israel. In fact, the Israeli hospitals were full 
of the uh, injured soldiers from Al Qaeda and from ISIS, and even the former uh, head of the uh, Mossad, he was on uh, on Al Jazeera, he confessed and he said that they have given medical treatment to Al Qaeda fighters in the Israeli hospitals, because for them, this was a humanitarian uh, thing to do back then. But we all know that wasn't the case. They wanted to use these forces against their mutual enemy back then. But when these territories were liberated, the Syrian side with the collaboration and coordination with Iran and Hezbollah, they have formed new units and those are called the uh, Golan Liberation Units. And those are two units, in my opinion, they will be engaged in a um, uh, ground offensive uh, in, 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 into the Golan Heights, which belongs to the Syrians, according to every UN Security Council resolution, in order to try to liberate it. I think the players in the region, they can see clearly that the United States is... Um, not in its uh, peak of its power, and it's been involved heavily in the Ukraine war, they believe that this is an opportunity probably also uh, to bring the United States into another costly war, which you can see that the Americans are printing hell of a money in order to sustain uh, these two big wars in Ukraine and in, and in Israel. And this is not in the interest of the Americans now to get involved in a big conflict, but the Israelis, they are definitely uh, dragging the Americans into bigger conflict instead of calling for ceasefire, for example, in the Gaza Strip to the Hillary Clinton said that his ceasefire is uh, equivalent of helping Hamas. You're giving a service to Hamas if you call for a ceasefire because the goal is quite clear. Ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, 2.2 million people to Sinai, and they're trying to bribe uh, Egypt, uh, telling them we can pay you $5 billion, $8 billion, $20 billion to house these uh, people permanently. And uh, this is the, just the second Nakba. I mean, 48 was clear that all these Palestinians who became refugees, this was the same way that they became refugees uh, 70 years ago. Let's talk about Assad. Let's talk about, you've been covering this on your show, which is the growing plot to assassinate President Bashar al-Assad. Can you talk about what you see in terms of reports about this and and how this would unfold? Yeah, uh, first of all, I uh, read this uh, report, intelligence report in Yedirot Ahranod, and it was translated to English. I was astonished that the Israelis are threatening Assad with assassination if Hezbollah intervenes in this conflict. So I started asking my contacts in Damascus, and they told me that they are very alarmed by these reports, and they take it uh, very seriously, because there is a precedent of killing uh, presidents and leaders in, in the region. They have killed Saddam Hussein in the most heinous way. Uh, you agree with him or not, that's a different thing. But it was a, a killing of a leader of a country. There is a, the incident of killing uh, Gaddafi, uh, again, by the NATO uh, proxies. So they tried to kill Assad for 12 years. Uh, I mean, uh, when ISIS was expanding and they were knocking the door of Damascus, John Kerry told uh, the so-called Syrian opposition figures in a, in a private meeting, and this was recorded and leaked by WikiLeaks, that they were watching the expansion of ISIS and they found it uh, uh, convenient for them because they wanted to pressure Assad. If ISIS managed to break in into Damascus and and the rockets of ISIS were falling around the presidential palace of Syria, what what could would have happened to Assad, you, you think? They would have killed him, right? So they wanted for Assad to die in the past 12 years. So I, And now when uh, the pro-Syria alliance emerged victorious, I do not rule out the possibility at all that they would try to kill Assad this time directly instead of trying to do it uh, through the proxies. And a very good uh, colleague of mine, has very good contacts in, in the United States, in State Department, and also in the CIA. He was also asking around, and they told him clearly, clearly, like two months ago, since two months, they're thinking of getting rid of Assad and finishing the unfinished business in Syria once for uh, once and for all, because they believe that the regime change war that has failed, and they thought that they can later pressure Assad by through uh, the sanctions, it's not working. And the uh, Chinese are now striking deals with Assad. There is now strategic partnership between China and uh, and Syria, and Syria will be on the uh, Silk and Road Initiative road. So they want to 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 stop this. They don't want for Syria to emerge victorious and to reconstruct. So the, the other thing that I mentioned, the report of Yedot Ahranod, the uh, former MI6 agent, uh, Alistair Cook, he also mentioned the same information exactly. And he said that he is highly alarmed and he, this is very uh, worrying for him that the Israelis are thinking in this way. And unfortunately, I'm saying in the current mentality that is governing Israel and from the statements that we see and we hear every day, what they're speaking about the Palestinians and what they are planning for the Palestinians, 
um, it's 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 clear cut psychopathy in my opinion, and they I do believe that they uh, would not hesitate to uh, assassinate Assad if the uh, opportunity arises for them. Hmm. Yeah, they've been like you said, they've been trying to do it for years and have failed. And of course, over the past few weeks, you've seen a number of news reports saying that uh, Assad has won in Syria. I saw an Al Jazeera piece on this. I saw Axios. I saw other saying, you know, now that Assad has won, has finally won Syria. He's made these partnerships. He's, you know, that this is a clear indication that find, that Assad has overcome these assassination attempts and everything that the West has kind of thrown at them. And I don't think they like that. I don't think they like these uh, these headlines showing that Assad has beaten them. Actually, they are very uh, aggressive in their approach toward Assad, and there is uh, always an appetite for war, right? In in Washington D.C., there is always appetite for war because uh, the economy is based on war, and they make profits when there is war. And also, they are very uh, arrogant in a way that they don't accept defeat. And the uh, the examples in the past in Iraq and how they killed Saddam and Gaddafi. And when a president like Syria, a smaller country than in Libya and in, in Iraq, with the help of his allies, he survived. This is for them humiliating. And we can see that the shift started to happen after the Syrian war in the balance of power. We started to see that uh, Russia has become more emboldened, for example, to wage its special military of, uh, offensive against uh, against Ukraine, because the Russians also gained their combat experience in Syria. They have tried their weaponry, they have tried their air force, and they have seen that the proxies of the United States is not are not invincible, and they, they can defeat them. And this was also emboldened Russia into going into Ukraine, and now we can see that this is a gradual change in the balance of power, and Syria played an essential role in it. So before the next elections in 2024, in my opinion, especially after the failed counteroffensive in Ukraine, which is another slap in the face of the establishment in the U.S., huge, huge failure, tens of billions of dollars poured into, into Ukraine to just break through the first or the second uh, defensive lines, and they couldn't do it. So they can't swallow these uh, this defeats. And, and in my opinion, they will try to achieve strategic uh, victory in the Middle East before the next elections. Uh, otherwise, in my opinion, the, uh, after the next uh, elections, we will see that the American, American power and the ability to project its power uh, around the world will diminish. And uh, they have to accept then the fact that they are not alone in, in, in the international system. If they achieve a victory in Syria, they may pretend that they can prolong the life of the empire. But if they can't do it now also in Palestine and in Syria, I think we are going to see the multipolar, multipolar world in a, very, in, a, uh, in a shorter time than expected. I think you're right about that. Kavor Kalmasian, uh, always great to see you. His uh, website, of course, your, his YouTube channel is uh, Syriana Analysis. I encourage all of you to subscribe to it. Follow him on Telegram as well. Always uh, very insightful um, on all of these issues. Kavor, great to see you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clayton. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.